Welcome. Welcome to Montreal West United Church. I'm so happy that you have had this chance to worship with us. We just welcome you this morning or whenever you're watching this broadcast. Um, we're going to begin our broadcast this morning, uh, the fourth Sunday in Lent, with uh, some announcements. And uh, my first announcement is, uh, I just want to say again, what a, what a privilege I feel that I'm able to spend so much time in our sanctuary. Uh, I know it's a place that we haven't been in for about a year. In fact, today is the anniversary of the first service that was canceled uh, back last March. So it's been a whole year now since we've been able to worship in the sanctuary. And it's such a, a joy for me to be here. And I know that may be hard uh, for, for those who can't be here. But I just I it'll be better once we're all together. Uh, for now, I can tell you that uh, we're still... The, the sanctuary is still living very much as if uh, as if nothing was changed. And uh, today I see all the Lenten decorations that have been hung. I'm looking at them and I know Kevin's been taking pictures uh, so that you'll be able to see them as well. And I just want to thank to our uh, decorating team. I know Susan and Marnie, and if I'm missing a name, I do apologize. Uh, the whole team, whoever was involved, I'm thanking you too. Uh, the sanctuary looks amazing and this is an amazingly important season leading up to Easter and uh, just uh, the church is still open even though we can't gather we're still very much alive and very much in the midst of Lent. My other announcements Sunday school at 1030 so sometime after we finish the uh, the children's moment hopefully uh, you'll have a, a device a laptop something so that your kids can go and join Mary in the Montreal West Sunday school at 1030 on Zoom uh, confirmation classes start next Sunday, and those are going to start at 1.30. And uh, that's because we have a session meeting next Sunday. Not today, next Sunday. Uh, there's a session meeting. I'll announce that next Sunday, though. As for this Sunday, we do have a governing board in two days, on Tuesday evening at 7.30. And uh, just to give you also a reminder that uh, potted plants, we, we are doing the potted plants again for Easter. So... If you would like to buy a potted plant, you need to contact the office. You need to contact Vicki by email or telephone. And then you need to get a check or cash to her for $20. And then we'll buy a plant in, in someone's name. You get to decide who, whose name the plant is dedicated to. And all of those names will be part of our Easter service, uh, kind of a memorial. So anyone you'd like to buy a potted plant for in remembrance or for whatever reason, uh, that's uh, that's what we're doing for Easter. And then those plants will go to brighten the days of people who may be having an especially hard time uh, during this pandemic, especially people who live by themselves. So uh, so our potted plant ministry is happening. Get a get your, your request to Vicki by email or phone, $20 check or cash to Vicki, and then we'll dedicate that plant on Easter and get it to someone's home who will really, really enjoy it. My final announcement is I'm a few days early, but happy St. Patrick's Day. Faith in Begora to you. I had to look up what Begora is. It actually means by God in Gaelic. So faith by God. Faith in Begora. Um, I hope this is a wonderful week. It's a very happy time in my house, St. Patrick's Day, since I have uh, roots in Ireland. And to all of the Irish and all of the Irish on St. Patrick's Day only, faith in Begora to you. And uh, it's now time for us to begin our worship today, which actually is a theme of faith, is in our worship today. So let's, let's begin our worship. Let's pray. Where hearts are fearful and confined, Loving God, grant freedom and daring. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, loving God, grant peace and reassurance. Where impossibilities close every door and window, where neighbor can only be seen as stranger, loving God, grant imagination and resistance. Where distrust shapes every understanding, loving God, grant healing and transformation. Where spirits are daunted and dimmed, loving God, grant faith, grant soaring wings, and strengthen dreams. Amen. As I always say, where two or more are gathered, Christ is with us. 
it's now time for us to worship God. Amen. Don't be afraid, my love is stronger, my love is stronger than your fear. Don't be afraid, my love is stronger, and I have promised, promised to be. Don't be afraid, my love is stronger, my love is stronger than your fear. Don't be afraid, my love is stronger, and I have promised, promised to Welcome, everybody. This is uh, our children's moment, and so uh, their Sunday school will be, I'm not sure what time it exactly it is right now, but uh, uh, our Sunday school will be happening soon with Mary, so uh, this is your chance to, to get ready for that. But before you leave, you know, this service and go and join the Sunday school, I thought we could spend a short moment together. Welcome to all the young people still all alone here on the stairs, waiting for your return, uh, looking forward to the day when we're all here and singing and worshiping together again. But uh, so happy that we can still worship this way through the internet. So welcome, and today I want to talk about Lent again. It's something that we talked about about two, two, three weeks ago. And uh, we began in that, in that day, I talked to you, remember, about building muscles or having superpowers and how Lent isn't about punishing ourselves or feeling bad. It's about developing ourselves, making ourselves learn and become better people. You know, and so I talked about how uh, the things that we do in Lent can be difficult things. We uh, look for things to do for people, look for things to do to make people happy. And by doing that, we strengthen the muscles uh, of, uh, of being a follower of God, being a, a disciple of God. Uh, we learn to, uh, to hear people that need help, to see people that are in trouble, and to love people, all people. And so I want to check in now and ask you, uh, how you're doing on uh, building those muscles. What have you been doing for the last three weeks to, uh, to become those amazing better people at the end of Lent? You know, the better people that we all want to be, better followers of God, better people more filled with love. And uh, I want to remind you that if you go on our website, sorry, if you go on our Facebook page, if you go on the Montreal West United Church Facebook page, you'll see a whole bunch of suggestions. And we do this every year. Our outreach committee does this amazing work, uh, you know, giving us ideas for Lent. And I have a copy of this week's ideas, and I'm going to read them with you. These are some things that we could be doing in order to become those stronger, faithful people, you know, strengthening our, our ability to hear and see people that need help and our ability to love people. So the suggestions for this week on our Facebook page, and please everybody, you know, uh, our, uh, our children, our children at heart, everybody go and check this out. Uh, so we've got a seven-day schedule here. On Sunday, say a bedtime prayer, thanking God for someone special in your life. Isn't that a beautiful idea? Who, who would you thank God for? Maybe you, you couldn't even keep it to one. Maybe it'll have to be lots of people. That's okay. But thank God for somebody in your life. Monday, draw a picture or send a note to a senior you know. A grandparent, maybe a parent, a neighbor, an aunt or an uncle. Make them a picture and then ask someone to uh, deliver it to them or to mail it to them. Might even be a better idea. Um, uh, Tuesday, offer to help with a chore at home that you normally don't do. So this isn't your regular chores. 
This is an extra chore, something extra that you can do to help a brother or a sister or maybe your, one of your parents, something that'll make their day a little easier. That's Tuesday. Wednesday, draw a picture or write a thank you note to a teacher you know. So think about who are all the teachers in your life. You may have more than one or maybe you still just have kind of one teacher at school. Write them a thank you note. Thank them for being a special person in your life. Thursday, say thank you to someone who is there for you. Maybe a school crossing guard, a volunteer, someone who volunteers at your school. Volunteers deserve extra special thanks. A pharmacist or a person uh, who's uh, providing essential services, like maybe a nurse that you might know or a family friend or maybe your mom's a nurse or a neighbor. Thank them for the work they're doing at this difficult time. On Friday, you are challenged to draw a picture or write a thank you note to a member of your family or your church family. So again, a, a thank you note to, uh, to someone connected with this church family, with our church family. And then finally, our challenge for Saturday is to collect all those loose coins in your family's pockets, purses, dishes. It doesn't say it here, but I know one of the best places to collect loose coins is in the couch cushions. So you can look in the couch cushions uh, or wherever, get some, some loose uh, coins and uh, donate that money to, uh, let's say, the food, the community food depot here in NDG. That would be a good one, a really, really good one. They've been working extra hard and so they need our support. So those are the suggestions for the next seven days. You have all those? You are making notes, of course, or maybe you've got them memorized doesn't matter because they're on the Facebook page. So just go to the Facebook page and you can see all of these challenges. I will be doing these challenges this week. Hope you'll be doing them with me. Let's say a short prayer together before you go to Sunday school. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for this journey, this Lenten journey, this time for us to journey to become better people more loving people, people who are your true followers, people who really love God. Because we know that loving God means loving one another. And we just want to be better and better at loving one another. So God bless us on our journeys. Thank you for our journeys. And thank you for being with us, especially in the difficult times. And we ask your blessing on all of us. And bless Mary and uh, all the people that, uh, that work to make Sunday School and to make our youth here at Montreal West so amazing. We pray in Christ's strong name. Amen. Have fun in Sunday School today, and we'll see you again next week. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, are you really there? And do you hear and answer every child's prayer? Some say that heaven is far away But I feel it close around me every time I pray Heavenly Father, I remember now Something that Jesus told disciples long ago Suffer the children come to me father in prayer and coming now to thee pray he is there speak he is listening you are his child his love now so children as such is the kingdom the kingdom of heaven give me a paw oh that's nuts A reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 4 to 9. 
From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it out on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Thank you, Vicki. Have you ever heard of Shark Week? It's a legendary television success story, the brainchild of a trio of executives at the Discovery Channel in 1988. Back then, Discovery had just created Space Week, a whole week of television programming devoted to space exploration. It did really well, and the channel was trying to think about ways to duplicate that success. The executives decided to look at the ratings of their nature programs, and they noticed something that was even amazing to them. Shark shows, te television shows about sharks, had double the ratings of any other nature shows, any other shows about animals or nature. And so one of the executives wrote two words on a napkin, and then he passed the napkin to his other colleagues, and the two words were Shark Week. And the rest, as they say, is history. In its, on, its on its debut night, Shark Week delivered 3.64 million viewers, which for a specialty channel devoted to science and nature was phenomenal. Best ratings they ever had. Shark Week now gets up to 40 million viewers throughout the week. Uh, the week, Shark Week. Uh, it's been a television institution now for over 30 years, and it's seen in 72 countries. The television industry, in that industry, the term Shark Week means anything that's a runaway success, a wild success. As in, how well do you think this show is going to do? It's going to be Shark Week. That means, I mean, that's just how successful this whole week was. But the question is, my question to you is, why is it so popular? Why is Shark Week so popular and why are sharks so much more popular than other subjects in nature? Do you think that it has anything to do with fear? We fear sharks. I think most of us do, not all of us, some of us, most of us. And so because of that fear, I think they fascinate us. Even if we don't fear sharks, the fact that they are so powerful and potentially so scary fascinates us. We fear the deep, the water, the oceans, and so that adds to our fascination. Personally, I love Shark Week, but I'm even more fascinated by shows about snakes. Venomous snakes scare me even more than sharks. And maybe that's why I'm a sucker for a documentary about snakes. I used to love watching Steve Irwin of the Sydney Zoo. He was known as the crocodile hunter. But my favorite shows weren't the ones when he was wrestling crocodiles. I liked the shows about snakes which his country, Australia, has in abundance, along with all kinds of deadly spiders, jellyfish, crocodiles, and let's not forget about sharks. In fact, as beautiful as Australia is, it's one country that I'm in no rush to visit. It seems that every time I see any show about Australia and about the, the natural life in Australia, they're talking about some deadly or venomous creature that can kill you with a single bite. But I have a funny story for you. A friend of mine was taking a helicopter tour of British Columbia. They wanted to see the bears, the grizzly bears, the brown bears of British Columbia. And it was a tour uh, in the, the BC outback, if you will. Another family was sharing the tour, and they were from Australia. And that family told my friend that they'd always dreamed of visiting Canada because they had been long fascinated by television shows about Canadian wildlife, which they considered to be the most terrifying on earth. My friend was astonished, just like me. He's spent his whole life watching shows about Australia and all those deadly creatures that can bite you and kill you with one bite. 
And here this Australian family is saying that they had come to Canada to see its terrifying wildlife that they had been watching television shows about all of their life. They had been seeing shows about cougar attacks, 12 foot tall grizzly bears, packs of wolves roaming wild. There are no big predators in Australia other than maybe dingoes. So apparently they find the idea of our giant cats and bears very, very exciting and very, very terrifying. But they had this slightly unreal image of Canada. They couldn't understand how it was that we were able to go about our everyday lives, not paralyzed in fear from all the terrifying things that lived in this country. Which may sound naive or silly, but one of I, I had kind of the same idea about Australia. One of the shows that they had seen was about a cougar that was trying to open a door and get into an elementary school. That is terrifying. I'd be terrified if I saw that show, but this is what colored their understanding of what Canada was all about. They imagined that we all lived here in Canada in constant fear of a cougar getting into one of our classrooms. I've never even seen a cougar outside of a zoo, and you know what? On that helicopter trip, they never even saw a bear. It was quite an eye-opener for both families. And I'm told that uh, there are many Australians that go their whole life without seeing a deadly snake other than in a zoo. I was horrified once about a, an Australian a man who was driving his car and they made this documentary about it and a snake was in his engine and it got out through the dashboard and it was venomous and it was crawling out from behind his dashboard as he was driving. That's the day I decided I was never going to go visit Australia. Couldn't deal with that if I was driving a car in Australia. But is that really a fair representation of what Australia is? Are cougars a fair cougars in schools a fair representation of what Canada is? And I think the common element here is that television does somewhat distort reality. Who knew that television could do this? But the bigger question is why? Why with all the beautiful places and miraculous creatures of the earth, why are we so obsessed with the ones that terrify us? Why is it that a show about a cougar venturing near a school gets ten times the viewers as one about the beauty of birds or flowers or even something like pollution, which is actually a greater threat to our survival? I'm not, I'm not even sure we can blame television fully for this. They would probably be happy to produce shows celebrating the beauty and majesty of nature, but they've learned that if they want to be successful, they need to give us shows about things that scare us. Those shows will get double or even ten times the audience. And all of this brings me to a story about magnetism. It was what I'm really going for here is this, you know, what fear does to us. What fear does on our journeys, the journeys we're on as human beings. And this was a lesson that I learned from watching a documentary about journalism. It was a fascinating documentary, but what I remember most is this small segment from the, from the story. And it was about how journalists had created this fear, or they had jumped, they hadn't created it, that's not fair, but they had jumped on this fear that some families had of power lines, the magnetic energy of these power lines being outside their children's bedrooms was causing them to panic. And the, and the news media jumped on it and began running stories about power lines causing cancer, magnetic, magnetic energy causing cancer being a carcinogen, and the lines being too close to homes. And this exploded, and all of the news sources and papers were selling tons and tons and tons of papers and, and the news was reporting this and it was getting all kinds of coverage and uh, this documentary that was warning us about the power of fear in the media said that after the newscast about a story on magnetism causing cancer in children there was a commercial that came on between, between the news stories and the commercial was for these bracelets these magnetic bracelets that apparently you wear and they have all kinds of health benefits. And one was to prevent cancer. And so there was this wonderful, delicious human irony that everyone had rushed to their TVs to watch a TV show about how magnetic energy was causing cancer. And then once they had finished seeing the show, a commercial came in about how magnetic energy can cure you of cancer. It was just this wonderful thing. But it's what I really want to get at today, fear. What does fear do to us? How does it operate? How does it affect us? How does it 
affect us on this journeys, these journeys we're on during Lent and even for the rest of the year. I found this quote by Bertrand Russell, fear is the main source of all superstition, but it's also one of the main sources of all cruelty. To conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. That's by Bertrand Russell, a devout atheist, a, a famous lifelong atheist. But he still could see the power that fear had, how it grips us and takes over us, consumes us. And we often speak of fear as gripping us or consuming us. It has the ability to take hold of us like very few things can. And he could see how it changed the way we thought and the questions we asked, how it closed us to asking the questions we needed to be asking because we were just focused on these, these things causing us fear. We fear difference. We fear people who aren't like us. We fear things we don't know. And when it comes to people, love, what is Lent all about? Learning to love, learning to have more love in our hearts. Fear is a profound, a profound thing. It closes our mind, gets us stuck. Just think about the way we view strangers, people we don't know, how fear closes us off from ever getting to know them. And that's why fear is such an important thing on our Lenten journeys. And uh, what I want to talk about is something that Bertrand Russell named it, you know, fear closes our minds, origins of cruelty, superstition, closed minds, minds not asking proper questions. But what's the answer to fear? How is it that we overcome fear? What's the answer when thi there are some things that are really scary? What do we do when we're scared? And that brings me, I only have a few minutes left, to our scripture, to our scripture today, the story of ne Nehushtan, the snake idol. Such an unusual story. Bible, very much against idols, always. And yet this story, Moses, the God uses, creates this idol. Such a strange story. The people of Israel are on their journey to the promised land. They take a shortcut. Now it says that God ordered them. It says clearly, God ordered them to take the shortcut. But I'm not sure about that. Usually shortcuts are our ideas. Maybe God just got blamed after the fact. I don't know. But they took a shortcut and they became in this place, in this place they found themselves, was inundated, infested with snakes. Since I've been watching my nature documentaries, I can tell you the snakes were saw scale vipers, the only really dangerous snake that lives in that area, but it also happens to be the most dangerous snake on the planet, the snake responsible for more human deaths than any other snake on earth, a saw scaled viper, deadly snake, aggressive, angry snake, and they were suddenly in an area that was infested with them. And so God tells Moses, take an image of the snake and put it on a tall pole and plant it down. And if anyone is bitten by the snake, they need only go and look at the snake, this, this snake idol, Nehushtan, it was called. Uh, we know this from other stories later in the Bible and for thing, uh, stories that aren't even in the Bible that we know from history. Nehushtan was the snake. Put it and then all someone has to do is look at it and they will be healed. They will be cured. Amazing. What's going on in this story so odd that, you know, God would be offering them this idol? for them to look at and be cured by. But that's exactly what happened. Nehushtan became an idol. Um, you know, scholars believe that this was an idol that, the, the, that was a Canaanite idol, but that the Jews adopted and began to worship Nehushtan, the snake god. You know, a snake on a pole. We have all kinds of images. This is a real thing from history. And it was worshipped, and it was worshipped by the Israelites. And uh, here we have a story of how it came to be worshipped, the role it played in the Exodus and in the promised land. What's it all about? Well, Book of Kings tells us how the story ended. The people of Israel loved the snake god so much that they began to worship it. Hey, bitten by a snake, miraculous healing. Let's worship this thing. They began erecting Nehushtan statues everywhere, and it became a very, very powerful cult, a cult of Nehushtan. Book of Kings, their god is now trying to get rid of this cult, and uh, we hear the ending of the story. What's it been all about all along? Well, this is where the story needs to be understood. It doesn't actually say in the Bible, but it was kind of a trick the whole time. You know, uh, God told Moses to put this snake on a pole and people began to be healed by looking up at the snake and then they began to worship the snake, but that was the trick. God was testing them. The, the, the answer in the book of King comes all along. God, God never intended for the snake to be worshiped. The snake was only uh, a means uh, it was almost a test. 
the idea was that when they feared or when their lives were in peril, God just wanted them to look up at God. The, not to see the statue, not to see the snake. That was what was right in front of their face, but God wanted them to look up. Pull, that was the key. And all along, God wanted them, God didn't want to tell them, I want you to look at me. God wanted them to figure it out on, the, on their own. So put this snake on the pole, this thing that they were most scared of. I fear, what do I do? Look up. When you fear, look up. Look up at God. Turn to God. That's really the message. Turn to God when you fear, and that's the right thing to do. Israel's mis- they, they misunderstand, just as we misunderstand today, and we start to fixate on the thing in front of our face, the fear, whatever it might be. We, we fixate on the thing we, f- we fear, and we don't see what's behind it. We fixate on the, what's scary about Australia. We don't see the, the beautiful country that's really there. People in Australia fixate about the things that are fearful about Canada. They don't see the, the true beauty of what's there. We fixate on what scares us about our neighbor or even about a stranger, and we don't take the time to get used to what's really there. But when we fear, how is it that we're going to get over our fears? The answer, turn to God, look up, look within, turn to God, see past what we fear. You know, I found this quote online. It said that fear and faith are opposites. Where there's faith, there can be no fear. Where there's fear, there can be no faith think they're on to something, but I'm not sure that that's quite true. There's another quote that says, courage isn't f- having no fear, it's overcoming our fear. And so I do think fear and faith have this oppositional relationship, but I think fear isn't about having, sorry, faith isn't about having no fear. I think faith is about being able to overcome our fears, finding in God the courage to overcome our fears and get past this closeness, this narrowness of vision that fear causes and being able to see what's really, really out there and how beautiful this world is and how beautiful our neighbor and even strangers are. This is my Lenten message on our journeys to the promised land or our Lenten journeys to Jerusalem to become better people. Faith helps us to take the next steps despite our fears. Fears have a strange but powerful ability to distract us, to narrow us, to close our minds, close our minds to the truth about a beautiful country, maybe the truth about another person or a stranger. could be anything. Sometimes we're so taken with fear for things and people we don't, we don't really know. We're taken by that fear. We're prevented from getting to know them. So scared we don't even know where to turn. We do know where to turn. Turn to God. Faith faith helps us to overcome our fears, helps us to live with our fears, helps us not to be narrowed or closed by our feared our fears. And it's an important lesson for people searching for the promised land. Lent is about building muscles and faith is an important muscle for any journey, especially a journey that may may have fear as part of it. I'm going to end with St. Patrick. St. Patrick, of course, cleansed Ireland of all the serpents. If you're a snake lover, by the way, that may not be such a wonderful thing, but it's, it's a metaphor. It is symbolic. St. Patrick was able to rid Ireland of any th- these things that we fear, and of course he did it with his great prayer. God with me, God before me, God behind me, God within me, God beneath me, God above me. God on my right, God on my left, God when I lie down, when I sit down, when I arise, God in the heart of every man who thinks of me, God in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, God in every eye who sees me, every ear that hears me. This is the secret to living a life with where faith overcomes fear. It is time for us to return to our Lenten journeys. Fear not, for God is with us. Amen.
time for us to pray together. Um, I invite you to take this time to uh, prepare yourself for prayer and also to think of the names of those who you'd like to, uh, to pray today. I haven't received any names, but you can always send me those names if you'd like me to name them uh, on the broadcast. But uh, for today, I just invite everyone to hold the names of special people, special reasons in their hearts, and uh, we're going to pray. But our prayer today is, is a special prayer. It is an anniversary today, as I mentioned. It's been a year since we've been we're able to worship together, to gather together. Sorry, it hasn't been a year since we've been able to worship together. But it's been a year since we've been able to gather. And this week, this week past, there were special services honoring uh, all of the people who have died or just suffered or had their lives changed uh, through this pandemic. And so on the very first week of worship, when we returned to worship uh, last year, we had a special prayer written by our moderator, Richard Bott, and so uh, let's pray it again together again so uh, my friends let us pray loving god in this time of covid 19 we pray when we aren't sure god help us to be calm when information comes from all sides correct or not help us to discern when fear makes it hard to breathe and anxiety seems to be the order of the day Slow us down, loving God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to be socially connected when we have to be socially distant. Help us to love as perfectly as we can, knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. For the doctors, we pray. For the nurses, we pray for the technicians and the janitors and the aides and the caregivers, we pray. For the researchers and theorists, the epidemiologists and investigators, for those who are sick, for those who are grieving, we pray. For all who are affected all around the world, we pray. For safety, for health, for wholeness, we pray. May we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked and house those without homes. May we walk with those who feel they are alone. And may we do all that we can to heal the sick, in spite of the epidemic, 
in spite of the fear. Help us, O God, that we may help one another in the love of the Creator, in the name of the Healer, in the life of the Holy Spirit that is in all and with all, we pray. May it be so. And now I I invite you to pray with me the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for being here, for joining us for worship today. For those who love puzzles or riddles, one thing has been changed in this image, in this thing you're watching, and I challenge you to tell me what it was. But for now, I'm not going to tell you. You can figure, you can watch the broadcast as many times as you want. Something just changed. I won't say any more, but I'd like to say thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for sharing worship with us. Um, It is so wonderful to be able to share worship with you, and I thank the people who have made this possible. Thank you to Kevin and Samantha and Owen. Thank you to Roy, Stevie, our amazing choir leads, and our amazing choir. 
you know, I'm, I'm learning all the time and we're, we're learning how much change the choir has gone through in order to go from live to online music. It has not been easy and they're doing an outstanding, phenomenal job. Extra special thanks to Samantha and all the members of the choir. Thank you to Vicky for our reading. I also want to say that, uh, as you know, a couple weeks ago, or last week, we had a little bit of water in the basement. And so, Daryl, you've been doing an outstanding above and beyond job. We're just so grateful. Thank you to our decorators for keeping our sanctuary decorated, just as it would uh, until we can gather again. I'm looking forward to that day. God bless you all, and may the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of God's hand. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>